Comforter, Spirit of Truth, art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasury of good things and giver of life. Come and dwell within us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Hey, welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday afternoon, joined by Father Brown. Father John Brown, SJ. So we're having coffee with a Jesuit. Father, how are you? I'm just fine. I'm on top of the world, in fact. Thank uh, you for having yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's an honor to have yeah. you. As I understand it, you watch the show often. In fact, I see you in the comment section. So you're you're a regular viewer. I spend more time on your channel than I should, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, it's an honor that you watch the show. Tell me a little bit first about yourself before we dive deep into, you know, specific topics. A little bit about yourself. When did you become a priest? Mm. Uh, when did you become a Jesuit? Stuff like that. Sure. Um, well, I am from South Louisiana, from uh, just outside of a small town called Eunice, Louisiana. Eunice. Uh, right. I grew up on a rice and crawfish okay. farm uh, oh, wow. just okay. outside of Eunice, Louisiana. Technically, the area that I grew up in was is called Patasa. It's it's called it's not just an area it's an area it's an area, area. Okay. it's an area <laughs> it's an area down there. I'm I I, yeah. I know Eunice sounds familiar, but I haven't heard mm -hmm. of the other one that you mentioned. Yeah, well, yeah. So Eunice is just south of Mamu. It's <laughs> just west of Opelousas. It's just okay. north of Crawley and east of Basil. So mm -hmm. if you know where any of those places mm -hmm. are, you kind of know where yeah. Eunice Crawley, is. Crawley, Louisiana. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So okay. um, so I grew up there. Uh, when I was 18, I left home and moved to Houston, Texas and worked there. I was actually a, a website developer. And okay. so uh, I started off thinking I was going to be a graphic designer and, yeah. and uh, I, I'd always loved art. I always felt like I was pretty good at it for the around compared to the people that I knew I was pretty good at it. And then sure. I, I got around a lot of other artists. And uh, quickly what I found out <laughs> was I was not that good. OK, uh, but I was hard working. And so people noticed that. And, and I ended up doing a lot of project management uh, instead of the actual graphic design. So I managed a lot of graphic designers mm -hmm. and programmers as well. I taught myself a tiny bit of programming. So you knew a little code. Okay. I did. I did know okay. a little bit. Right. Yeah. So um, mostly back in those days. So this is the sure. mid 90s. Okay. So it was a lot of uh, Perl, Java or... Perl, C plus uh, plus Java. JavaScript was just was just becoming a thing. The out. truth is, I, I knew enough to change those a little bit to to yeah. change the scripts a little bit. But in the end, uh, I was mostly coding HTML or really just having coders do it, and I could kind of help them understand where we wanted to go with a project, right. how to deliver on the deliverables, those sorts of things. Okay. Uh, and it was while I was in that job that uh, I began to have all of my dreams fulfilled, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, all yeah. of my dreams were coming true. Yeah. And, uh, I felt a certain emptiness inside, which mm -hmm. made me consider the priesthood. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, and I knew a lot of great people. I was working with great people. It was a great job. Were, I had, you know, were, were you pretty, you know, devout in your faith already or? Well, I had been raised Catholic mm -hmm. and I think my friends would have said I was on the more devout side okay. than, than they were. Okay. But knowing what I know now about what all that really is, right. I think I was convinced, but not necessarily convicted. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'd always love the arguments that people put forward to defend the church. I always thought those were good arguments. Um, that doesn't mean that I went to church every single Sunday like I should have or. Or, or you know, I, I went to confession probably once every couple of months. And yeah. well, I started to. Uh, start to feel a little bit empty inside. Like I said, after as things were coming together for me in my career, I started to feel a little bit empty inside and kind of feeling like I wasn't doing somehow what I was supposed to do. And I realized I never really asked myself, what does God want me to do? Yeah. And so I started to do that in prayer. And, uh, you know, I thought of a whole lot of things before I thought of the priesthood. I thought I'd make a bad priest. Honestly, I thought I'd, I thought I'd make a terrible priest. Um, but I kept feeling like God was welcoming me in that vocation. And so, uh, yeah. Well, you know what? There, there's a sense in which I, I envy that because, and and I imagine there's a lot of people who, when they're young, they're not asking those kinds of questions of discerning a vocation. Mm -hmm. And I know when I was younger, I did it. 
the priesthood was nowhere on my radar. I wasn't right. asking questions like that. I wasn't even Catholic at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I kind of envy that when I hear people <laughs> talking about discerning the priesthood yeah. and things like that when they're younger. I just think, man, yeah. I wish I, I, I wish I was doing that when I was yeah. younger. You know? Well, I wish I had done it when I was really little, right? <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had understood what it meant. Like I always just thought a person should do what they're good at. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I knew that I, I could draw. I could draw well, so I should be an artist, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, my dad, being a farmer, was just saying, like, you know, shouldn't you, shouldn't you do something that pays well? You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so knowing that all of a sudden my job was paying well, I just thought that's got to be confirmation okay. that what I'm doing is is exactly what I should be doing. Yeah. And yet all of the rewards that were coming from that were were very short lived, right? No. So. Um, but you said you had this emptiness. I did. In the midst of that. I did. I had a wonderful girlfriend. I really yeah. did. And uh, and and uh. I couldn't figure out why I didn't feel like I should marry her. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. You know, there's something was, you know, I, I couldn't say anything was wrong with her. I thought she was sure. great. Uh, but something kept yeah. pulling me to something else. And so that emptiness inside that restlessness led me to offer God my life in whatever, whatever way that he wanted to use me. And the priesthood eventually did, did someone suggest the priesthood to you or you Nobody just kind of intuitively priesthood, man. Wow, wow. <laughs> Nobody who knew me thought wow. I'd make a good, a good priest. I don't think I, but that's yeah, cool that you yeah. intuitively just started to discern that. Well, that's it's awesome. not so cool because I was living a life that didn't look like a very good, right? Okay. It wasn't, I, I, I make it sound like I was I a rock star. I was not living this rock sure. star lifestyle, but I, I was definitely nothing stood out to anybody yeah, that yeah. was around me at the time. But I knew inside it was more like there was just a radical transformation needed. And I felt like the call to the priesthood was was going to be part of that. And then the more I looked into the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, okay. uh, the more I saw, the, first of all, they have a long, long list of saints, many of whom sure. were not very saintly to begin okay. with. Okay. And so I thought, well, whatever works for those saints, I would like to at least give that a shot. Right? Ignatius himself was. Ignatius himself did yeah. not seem very saintly in yeah. the beginning. Francis Xavier did not seem very saintly in the beginning. Is that why you considered them rather than Dominicans? You were just attracted to the saints? Or? Well, I did consider some of the other orders. And the, when I looked into them, I, I always had had a profound respect for everybody. Yeah. And, and for the archdiocesan priests I knew, I had, I had a profound respect for that those spiritualities, those their way of doing things, but nothing called me except for the society of jesus except for that ignatian spirituality mm -hmm. that just really felt like wow this feels like home it, it, it felt like home to me mm -hmm. and uh that was all sort of an, in an idealistic way right so i hadn't known any jesuits before mm -hmm. i discerned that i should be a jesuit right yeah yeah so when i entered the jesuits i i, I did so not really knowing what i was going to encounter oh wow uh and uh that that was in about the year 2000 right so i i joined when i was about 25 years old and, and entered the novitiate which happened to be very close to home uh, as okay. the crow flies maybe 25 miles from where i grew up they have the novitiate that close yeah grand Coteau, louisiana is is pretty close because i'm already on that side of mm -hmm. the, the unis pata do, do, area is do you have to, a lot of catholics uh, over there in that area south louisiana is full of catholics yeah that's right south louisiana yeah. is full of catholics it's, we're it's different over here in northeast as you probably know that's right northeast louisiana it's mostly baptists and charismatics here um now when you start to get south new orleans i've noticed yeah a lot of catholics that's there. right we have a whole lot of catholics yeah. um and uh yeah it's it's a way of life it's in the, it's in the it's in the music it's mm -hmm. in the food it's in the all the festivals all the everything mm -hmm. uh so I, I always felt very supported by by that sense of catholicism that yeah. cultural sense of catholicism moving to texas living in houston I, I felt something similar there there were a lot of catholics in houston a lot of them there hispanic, are a lot there yeah uh, a lot of them hispanic and that you know so it was easy to find a good parish that sort of thing is that, is that how you learned spanish by the way no i know spanish now i only learned spanish once i entered the society of jesus uh so the jesuits sent me to live uh in mexico for a year so okay. i learned spanish there okay. i thought i thought i kind of knew it until i had to live there and then i really learned you it. learned it by yeah. you know, trial by fire that's you, right you, you that's had to right. learn it <laughs> i spent another year in el paso at our parish church in el paso which all of our ministry there is in spanish or it was when i was there at least and so yeah. i got a whole nother dose of, sure. of immersion sure. spanish and then uh i ended up in new orleans at jesuit high school teaching and uh one of our spanish teachers uh uh, uh retired abruptly at the very beginning of a year so i ended up picking up a year of teaching spanish even though i'd never taken any spanish oh, wow. classes right so I, i'm not at all i shouldn't be a spanish teacher but i was filling in for about a year so that helped actually that, that really helped so uh, that means either you were really good or they were very disparate One of well, the two. I think I, it, well i'd like to think it could be both at the same time right <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah probably a combination of both yeah that's awesome though yeah. i mean hey i'm wanting to learn spanish but um i think that i i, I could probably 
do it fairly easy because I've noticed there's a lot of similarities between words in Spanish and, and Latin. And I know a fair amount of Latin. So, so I, I learned off. Latin second and, and that oh, was, okay. it, it was much, I found learning Latin was easier, a whole lot more helpful to learn Latin once you already know Spanish. Okay. And now without knowing it at all, I could, I learned yeah. that I could pick up a, a newspaper in Portuguese and read that or a newspaper oh, wow. in, in, in Italian and read it. Once you've got Latin and one of the romance so you, languages, you can really read Italian then from, well, I say, I say really read. I can, yeah, I can yeah. take a newspaper article sure. and tell you more or less what it's about. Yeah, yeah. Right. Just because from knowing Latin and from no. knowing Spanish, you, you can learn, you can wow. figure out a lot. That's right. That's awesome. Of course, I might be making it up and think I know what I'm reading. So I, I don't even know. I might be just making the whole thing up. Yeah. Well, that that's great, though. That's a good skill. So, all right. So you started discerning the Jesuits. What made you say that, all right, this is where I need to be? Well, uh, so, well, first of all, they said yes. So that was... <laughs> well, that's one sign. Sure. I, I, yeah, I wasn't sure. expect. I, I really wasn't expecting them to say yes. I was not well-educated. I, I had not shown signs of being able to be well educated or anything like that. And so uh, they took a chance on me for sure. I knew they had done great things with people with, you know, they'd, they'd worked with, with yeah. very little and done great things. So I just was, was hoping that could happen. Sure. I, I joined the Jesuits in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. So that's a two year novitiate in Grand Coteau. So that two year novitiate is technically in Grand Coteau, but 12 months of that is spent on what the Jesuits call experiments. It's like uh, they, they send you to do jobs for two, three months at a time especially jobs they think you're going to be bad at. Right. Like so, uh, for example, they sent me to to work at the St. Thomas in the St. Thomas housing projects in New Orleans. Okay. Now, for a little guy from uh, Crawfish Farm in Eunice, mm -hmm. Louisiana, mm -hmm. to have to go to like to this inner city right. uh, place in, in New Orleans, it, it's it's not a good fit. But sure. they want to know how you react to that. Not a good fit. How does the Lord move in your life? How, how can you that discern your sense. own vacation through the, through these exper experiments, you know, these experiences? Uh, and so they're watching you. You're watching yourself, watching your own heart. You're still trying to do good work. Yeah. Um, so the novitiate is full of that sort of stuff, plus a 30 day silent retreat, which is super helpful. So right? are you literally silent, silent for 30 days or? Yeah. So so, you know, you're speaking the prayers of the mass out loud. OK, uh, there are two days that are spread apart throughout those 30 days where they're called a, a break day. And so there's just a little bit of break day where we where we, you know, share a little bit about some things and, and kind of talk some things out amongst ourselves, but then go right back into silence before the day is up. So it's less than 24 hours of of, of non silence across 30 days. What was that experience like having silence like that? I mean, it was, was it beneficial? Was it torture? Was it? It was the best yeah. for me. It okay. was really the best. So okay. so if you've ever tried to be quiet. Yeah. Right. You it's it's difficult. Right? Uh, uh, you know, what, what does scripture say? It talks about how we, we put a bridle in a horse's mouth to tell him where to go. You know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when you when you close your mouth and just listen, it can leave you a little bit lost, a little bit antsy, mm -hmm. wondering what you should do next. But St. Ignatius is very good. He's, he's got a, this prayer regime that he wants you to pray. The, this this way of, of, of engaging God. The, the, the first part of it is really all purgative. Right. So it's mm -hmm. it's knowing God's goodness and our own sin in comparison to that, you know, mm -hmm. so becoming really acquainted with the parts of us that that need to be healed and need need forgiveness and, and ways in which we need to be reformed. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we move into kind of the illuminative way where you, you learn a lot more about the life of Jesus using scripture, of course. Right. So you are really trying to put your mind into into scripture. So you are you're not just reading scripture and say, oh, look what Jesus did. But you're closing your eyes and imagining Christ doing those things. And when Christ tells the crowds, you know, something in, in, in scripture, you feel him say that to you, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he says, blessed are the poor. And you hear his voice, the, the quality of his voice. And you imagine he's saying it to you. Hey, you know, uh, Michael, mm -hmm. blessed are the poor. Blessed are you when you are poor, you know. And so that, that just has a powerful impact on a person when they can give themselves to that kind of mental prayer yeah. for so long. And then, uh, uh, you know, after that sort of illuminative way, there's this unitive way where you just begin to start saying, I, I want to draw closer to Christ crucified and, and to serve him, you know, under the banner of the cross. And and that that 30 day exercise, I, I already I was already pretty sure that God was calling me to be a Jesuit after the 30 day silent retreat, there was no turning back. There was oh, no looking so back. So that's kind of what sold you on it. Yeah. I, I in, in many ways, I, I might've thought I was sold before, but I was the way I knew I might not have been is that I often would ask myself before those 30 days, I would say, uh, if I had a, you know, a crisis, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, I, sure. I, I didn't get along with somebody, another Jesuit or, or, you know, the, my superior told me I did something wrong. I would ask myself, maybe I shouldn't be a Jesuit. After those 30 days, it was like, okay, as a good Jesuit, how do I handle this? Mm -hmm. 
And, and I just know that that, that shifted in my mind uh, after those 30 days. So it was just an, an excellent experience. So how does that work? Did you become a Jesuit first and then a priest, or was it the other way around? So, okay, for the Society of Jesus, you can certainly enter the Society of Jesus as a priest already. Yeah. But most people, meaning almost all of us, enter and then be and then we're trained to become priests so but after all the, jesuits become priests correct no we have brothers uh, oh. as well so we have some some unordained brothers as wow, well okay so yeah so you have um jesuit priests scholastics brothers um and and you know, the guys in formation are those are what we call scholastics the ones who are being formed for the but priesthood. some remain brothers non-ordained correct their, their entire life correct Correct. I did not know that. That's interesting. That's right. So we're, okay. I mean, we're a clerical order. We're a priestly yeah. order, but those brothers understand their vocation as supportive of that, even if they themselves are not ordained. That right? makes sense. Okay. So, but in your case, I think you entered to the Jesuits first before you were ordained. That's right. So I was not ordained. So I entered in 2000 and I was ordained in 2011. So that, okay. that was, so I went to school for a little while and, yeah. um, in St. Louis, I studied philosophy there, uh, which was great for me. I had not really studied anything before that. Yeah, and so yeah. to be introduced to philosophy, to come to love uh, that, that sort of um, intellectual life, it was just a, a wonderful time for me. Uh, then I went into a period what they call Regency. So that's two or three years where they send Jesuits to work somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I spent one year of that at a parish down in southern Mexico. Okay. And then two years at our high school in Tampa, Florida, where I taught theology. Uh, and then I went to study to study theology. So I was teaching mm -hmm. theology before mm -hmm. I studied it really. Wow. Uh, <laughs> then I go and, uh, and study theology at Boston college. I spent three yeah. years at Boston college, uh, then spent a year at, then I was ordained at the end of that time, what, right? A what priest, was that ordained like, a priest. by the way, at Boston college, Boston college, uh, you know, it's, it's different for a Jesuit no matter what, right? Okay. So we're living in a house full of international Jesuits. So I've, I'm living with guys from all parts of Africa, from all parts of the United States, from, you know, from, from the South, from the North, everywhere. And so that, for, I love that kind of environment. Right. Like I, one of my favorite things is to ask people who are from faraway places, hey, what's your favorite joke where you mm -hmm. come from? You know, and, and I, I, I love that. I thrive on that. So that's a that was a great time for me. At the same time, it's odd for me to live in the Northeast. I'm clearly from South Louisiana. I, I you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, all, all jokes aside, I like to hunt squirrel, you sure, know? Sure, sure. So like, you know, be, be, being in Boston was a little bit different, you okay. know? Uh, I can uh, see that. Yeah. And what, I'm, what I'm not the... a Patriots fan. I'm sorry, but uh, oh, you know. yeah, don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> we'll we'll right. have to, we'll have to cut that out later. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now. So what was the formation, however, like at Boston college, I kind of hear, you know, I, I hear things. What yeah. was it like? Well, OK, so there's so um, when you say formation, you know, there's a theology department right. and then there's also a school of theology and ministry. OK. And then there are those who are sort of we're all kind of our own cohort cohort within all of that. So, uh, for example, every Jesuit in the school of theology and ministry working mm -hmm. on, a, on a on an MDiv, on a master's of divinity, we've already got degrees in philosophy. So we come in operating and thinking in, in, in a certain way that maybe some pe other people are, are not. So they're searching for different kinds of answers than we might be searching for. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are working as deacons. So I was ordained to the diaconate a year before I was ordained the priest. And so mm -hmm. I was working in a local parish. I was teaching catechism before that at another parish. So we're, we're just engaged in a slightly different way. So I don't want to say anybody's experience isn't, you know, what sure. it is, but my own experience was it was uh you know b besides the weather being cold you know they're there i guess it was a you know a different culture and all that kind of stuff sure. i felt more culturally connected when i lived in mexico than i did when i lived did in the northeast it's that big a difference but the the school itself I, you know if you play your cards right you can take fantastic classes and come out you know come okay. come come away from that with it with a great experience so I, I took some classes at saint john seminary for example with the seminarians i took classes at, at the regular uh, school of theology at boston college a uh, harvey egan uh so i got a thm there as well i got an mdiv and a thm uh, uh father harvey egan who's just a, a, a fantastic academic uh, helped mm -hmm. me along with my with my thm uh, so i i personally it was great. I, I got a lot out of that. Well, I, I don't know that I would recommend it to everybody, but yeah. my experience but you, was, was fantastic. Good. Yeah. So yeah. in Boston, I just yeah. have to know. I know I'm being flippant here. Sure. But in Boston, do they actually say "ka" for car? They do. Right. <laughs> they do. As far as I could tell, that that all it all sounded awful to me. You know. Yeah. They. they I don't the know car, if I can get yeah. used to that. I don't yeah. Know. So well. So okay. So the so because I was living in a house that was so international and all that, so I, I was exposed to it. But I'll tell you. 
I, I, I get every year when the reading would come up, the psalm would come up, you know, if today you hear his voice, hide not your hides, oh, wow. you know, wow. and I heard that again wow. and again and again. And then sure enough, after I was ordained a priest and I was sent to El Paso, Texas, when that reading came up, the reader was from Boston and he gets up there and he starts saying, if today you hear his voice, I'm going to call here it comes again, you know, hats. I can't get away from that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hiding not your hides. Yeah, that's very, very different than the way they talk here. Yet, yeah. the people, at least in Northeast Louisiana, uh, do have a peculiar way of speaking as well. So I, I imagine if I somebody from fun. Boston came here, <laughs> I imagine they would think we're pretty I, weird. I think it sounds totally normal here, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll do my country impression here, but they'll usually say, say something like, yeah, y'all come on down here. We're going to have some barbecue and short ribs. <laughs> We're going to eat some rolls over there. All right. We'll have some sweet tea. That's yeah. that's North Louisiana all yeah. the way. That's yeah. 100%. The farther south you go, the more the, the more it starts to sound like this. You know, they, they kind of have that thick accent, and they don't have any THs or nothing like that. So <laughs> the worst thing to be is a, a Cajun with a lisp. Okay. Because, you, <laughs> because you can't say a TH no matter what, you know? So, yeah, it's pretty tough. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Cajuns, I had this um, – He's a guy who used to fix my Bronco too. Uh, so he's a mechanic. And he, I could not understand him. He was so Cajun. Yeah. That even people who are from here, nobody could really <laughs> understand him. It was so thick. Yeah. I wish yeah. I could do an impression of him, but sadly, yeah. I, it wouldn't do it justice. But. Well, I know when I first left <laughs> Eunice, I, I, I stopped in Texas to get, you know, to get something to eat. And uh, the waitress brings me, uh, you know, asked me if I want a salad. I said, sure, and she, you know, with my meal. And she said, uh, what kind of dressing do you want? And at the time I had a, a thicker accent. And so mm -hmm. I say, you know, I want some French dressing, you know. Ranch. And so she brings me ranch. ranch. And I'm like, what? I, this is, I, clearly I said French, you know. Yeah. And so, like, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. So, some of this, it, it took me a while. Now, I didn't have much of an accent, I would say, when I came from Israel to Louisiana. Or at least I don't mm -hmm. think I had much of an accent. For me, it wasn't so much that. It was just that I didn't understand certain basic things. For example, um, I thought you would pronounce knife kniffy. Oh, yeah. Um, or I would see a drink called Hick. It was called, called what? Hick. You ever heard of Hick before? I've never heard of you Hick. You know Hick. You know why you know Hick? You I'm know it I'm like searching my brain. You what know it this? as high C. Oh, hi, I see. did not know about the dash. So <laughs> I, I went to a restaurant and I asked yeah. for some hick and nobody yeah. knew what I was talking about. Yeah. So I pointed uh, at it. They told me it's pronounced high C. I, I so I had a learning yeah. curve there. You yeah. Know? <laughs> I, I don't want to send you viewers looking at other YouTubers channels, but there's yeah. this one video people should look up called Cajun OnStar. Oh, wow. Okay. And it's this poor guy who's lost talking to OnStar and he's a Cajun all the way. Right. So he's like, you know, oh, I'm lost. I'm I'm, I'm out by Boots Grocery. And, you know, and they say, can you spell that? He's like, yeah, Boots. B-O-O-T-H, comma to the top S, you know, <laughs> like Boots, you know. <laughs> That's a pretty good Cajun yeah. accent, by the way. I, know, I can tell you spent some time with the Cajuns. So. That's awesome. So you you ended up discerning the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. You discerned mm -hmm. the priesthood. 2011, I think, is when you said you became a priest. That's right. What's it been like being a Jesuit priest? It's been fantastic. So our formation is just so long, right? Yeah. So so 11 years is a long time to believe you should be a priest and not yeah, be yeah. a priest, right? That's that's yeah. very difficult. Now, we do a lot of work, and and and, and it was all grace-filled time, and I'm very glad that I went through it. In a lot of ways, it, it really prepared me well to be able to kind of like right out the gate, uh, be, be something closer to the kind of priest I think I should be, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but boy, it's a long time. It's a really long time. Are but, you assigned you know, to a parish as a, as a pastor? Or? It's it's common. It's not 100 percent of the time, but it's mm -hmm. very common in the United States, especially whenever a man is ordained uh, to the priesthood. He is sent to a parish. To mm -hmm. We were talking about Cajun stuff and now my Cajun accent. Yeah, I'm hearing it. <laughs> I, I, I can tell. <laughs> I gotta, yeah, it's, yeah. it's coming out. <laughs> yeah. So. So. Uh, yeah. So. So when a man is ordained, he often goes to work in a, in a, in a parish that first year. So think about it. A lot of times if you get ordained a priest and then you get sent to work in one of our Jesuit high schools, let's say. You could go years without doing a funeral, without yeah. learning to celebrate the mass, a funeral mass or baptizing a baby or doing a wedding or, you yeah. know, any of those things, any of the things all good priests should know how to do and should be able to, like, jump in there and do sure. it right without a whole lot of preparation. And so if you if you don't do that, you become the kind of priest who says, oh, I, I'm a high school guy. I don't do weddings or I'm a high school guy. I don't do baptisms, whatever. And, you know, you're ordained the priest to, to act as a priest, to function as a priest. So they. The practice is, is usually they send us to a, a parish 
to learn to do all those things so that in the future we take that that skill set with us, you know, into everything else that we do. And so now I'm out of high school and I find myself doing weddings all the time and oh, okay. baptisms all the time and funerals all the time. So it's it really prepares you to be more available for more things. And I think that we just don't have the luxury of not knowing how to do those things. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, just because I'm a Jesuit, it, I, I can't not make myself available to, to minister those ways, you know. Now, there's an impression that a lot of people have, and that is that the Jesuits are really, really liberal as an order. Can you can you maybe speak to that a little bit? <laughs> uh, yeah, or, no, or, yeah. not, or not? No, no, no. Listen, can... listen no, no, I'm happy to. I, I really am. I'm happy to. Uh, well, first of all, I would I would ask questions. What do you mean by liberal? Why sure. do you ask? All these kind of things, you sure. know. So, but in the end, I think it's it's pretty fair to say that the that the Jesuits that I've known. Mm -hmm. We all look a lot like uh, the diocesan priests that, you know, in terms of that, th those kind of polarized, you know, left or right, conservative, mm -hmm. liberal, traditional, uh, progressive, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, that all those things that we look a lot like the diocesan priesthood. So if you know a diocesan priest who celebrates, you know, uh, the traditional Latin mass, for example, mm -hmm. I know priests who do that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you if you know a priest who likes to you know to 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 stomp his feet and clap his hands during mass, I also know some Jesuit sure, priests like sure. that. Uh, all those things. So you you will find we're the largest men's order, yeah. and so you're going to find a whole lot of variance within our order. And a lot of times it's because we are we are taught to be uh, available and to 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 learn how to enculturate wherever sure. we go. And a lot of times Jesuits where they go, they get formed by the people they're they're trying to minister to. And so they they th th that happens the way that happens. I mean, every, anybody who knows me would tell you, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, they would probably describe me as conservative or whatever. But I, I don't I don't I wouldn't put those labels on myself. But it's sure. but but the the yeah, that's what you find. Sure. Well, that, that makes sense. And that's that's also helpful to know, because I think that people probably have some misimpressions there. Um, some misimpressions, I think, too, there's almost kind of like some. Um, almost some desires, right? So, you, yeah. so, you know, that, that people want to be able to peg the Jesuits down and mm -hmm. say, let me show you what I know about, mm -hmm. about the church in general. For yeah. example, those Jesuits, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're the bad guys or whatever. And I'm, and I'm thinking, well, do you know Mitch Pacwa? You yeah, know, yeah. do you know, Great, uh, Joe you know, Father, yeah, Pacqua, yeah, yeah. Joe Fessio, Mitch Pacwa, Father Joe Fessio, you know, I know those guys, those guys are fantastic. Yeah. Like yeah. those guys are really, really good. Absolutely. And, and, and they're not, they're not like the one exception to the rule or whatever. Like I, and then I hear people say, well, if you're going to be like those guys, you end up being, you know, sent to Siberia. I'm at my favorite place in the world and I'm the way that I am. You're not in Siberia. I'm, but I'm not in Siberia <laughs> and I love where I'm at. And, and Father uh, Pack was not in Siberia. Father Pack was not so. in Siberia. <laughs> Father Pesio is not in Siberia. Yeah. Yeah. I know a Jesuit who's in Siberia right. who's fantastic and loves it there, right? So, like, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, so it, it maybe if you know a Jesuit in Siberia, it's because they want to be there. I don't know, you know. Well, that, again, that's that's encouraging to hear. Mm -hmm. By the way, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the videos that um, some of the videos that I've reviewed, they always it's usually by really radical Protestants who want to pick on Jesuits. Right. right and they yeah, want to say yeah. anybody who is a Catholic is actually a Jesuit. Have you, have you seen any? Of I have videos? seen those okay. before. What, yeah. what did you think of that? <laughs> I was so upset that the secret was out, you oh. know, that because you know <laughs> we did everything we could to keep the fact that we assassinated Lincoln down <laughs> underground and they exposed as much it. as we could, and they exposed yeah. it. There they were, they exposed it. Um, no, I'm, I mean I'm surprised by that. Sometimes I read these things, and they're like, you know, every Jesuit takes a secret oath to, you yeah, know, yeah. To, to to kill any monarch who stands, but you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, <laughs> It's fascinating, uh, <laughs> but but you know that they're gonna yeah. say that I'm now a Jesuit. Because I have an interview with a Jesuit. Yeah. So by that logic, right. it, it means that I'm a Jesuit myself. Because. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wink, wink, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, listen, there's crazy people in the world. I don't right. know what else to say. And I, I do feel like I think a lot of them feel like they're they're called by God to, to be on this crusade to fix this thing that they that they see. And I always feel so sorry for them that I'm like, oh, you're spinning your wheels in the wrong direction. I, I just I wish they could see what is what is plainly true to me you know the jesuits from what i've seen have done some amazing things historically it seems like true. they've done a lot of scientific work i think in seism seismology i think almost everything yeah. is that right yeah, <laughs> yeah. um almost it, everything. it also seems like there are some pretty famous scientists isn't the one who came up with the Big Bang Theory wasn't he a Jesuit priest? No, he was not. He was not okay. a Jesuit priest. Uh, but there are lots of Jesuit priests yeah. who are in the Vatican Observatory. Uh, one of them, yeah. uh, not no relation to me, but Father David Brown, for example, okay. is doing great work there. Um, 
uh, brother, a, a, a Jesuit brother, brother Bob Mackey uh, is doing great work that mm -hmm. way. A guy Consigliman, I can't say his name. But yeah. Well, what, isn't it the case that one of the distinguishing features of the Jesuits is that there's a a, a peculiar loyalty to the Pope or some, something? Something. Like sure. That? Okay. So, um, all right. So, so Jesuit obedience works this way. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we're a very uh, top down, short chain of command order, okay. right? So it's it's God the Father, God the Son, mm -hmm. you know the the mm -hmm. Church, uh, the, by the, led by the Pope. And then we mm -hmm. have the Father General, mm -hmm. the, the provincial, mm -hmm. the local superior, mm -hmm. the the Jesuit man. Right. Okay. That's a pretty short chain of command overall. Right. Yeah. It's very very short. So uh, a strong sense of obedience is necessary. Okay. Um, that strong sense of obedience. Saint Ignatius breaks it down for us this way, and Robert Bellman uh, speaks very well about it. That you know, to be obedient, you need to at least do what you're told. Okay. Right? Then, to, to get better at it, you've got to uh, try to understand what you're being told and get on board with the idea. Right? Okay. So, I'm not just going to do what you say, but I'm going to try to guess why you say it, so I can I can be on board on and on your team about it. And then the really the highest level of obedience is that you hear the voice of Christ in your superior. Right? Okay. Okay. So. Uh, Saint Ignatius wanted it this way that 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 Jesuits, at least some of us, would take a vow of obedience to the Pope. So uh, there's this sense that uh, if you have the strongest sense of obedience, right, your obedience, and, and you have this vow, then when you hear the Pope speak, you're going to hear Christ's voice mm -hmm. in in what the Pope is saying. Now, what if your superior is wrong, mm -hmm. or what if the Pope is wrong? Do you have to hear Christ in well, that? I can tell you this, St. Ignatius, well, first of all, you know, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, obviously when someone commands you to sin, don't sin, right? Sure. That, that's just a fact. And St. Ignatius makes room for this when he says sometimes the facts force you to understand that, that that's just the way that it is. And someone's asked you to do something which is sinful, don't do it. Sure. Okay. But, however, mm -hmm. the highest form of sacrifice, anybody can, anybody can, can give the Lord, mm -hmm. is abnegation, which is to say that I'm not going to spend time judging what the pope has asked me to do okay i'm not going to spend time saying well is he right or is he wrong and if he's right then i will do it if he's wrong maybe i won't do it you you just say i i am not in a position to know everything he knows and i will abnegate i will give up my right to to, to sit here and discern and figure out and do all that kind of stuff i'm i'm going to hear his voice hear the, the voice of, of the lord in the, in the voice of my superior and i'm going to carry that out now is that and in a perfect world that's how that should work well, is that a standard that laity should also live by? Or is that just something that Jesuits should live by? Okay, so I would say this about any form of religious life, mm -hmm. that you have certain charisms that are useful to some and not useful to others. Mm -hmm. I do believe that that element of the Jesuit charism is something that ought to curb our uh, desires to bash the Pope. Okay, sure, <laughs> right? sure. Right, right. So there, there, there are some who it, it's it's like it's a sport, right? It's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a sport to bash the Pope and your local bishop and maybe even your local priest, and yeah. it's just a sport, right? And they, they just enjoy it, and it, it gives you some sense of power, and it gives you some sense of you know I'm able to respond to what I've suffered and, and do all that kind of stuff. I think that we could all, lay people alike, could all learn from the best Jesuits, who are the most obedient, and say if if those men can practice that sense of abnegation mm -hmm. the rest of us can can be a little bit more uh, reserved when we go to criticize those who have legitimate authority over us right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's helpful because i want to say so. that 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 goes against a lot of our inclinations but maybe Maybe because that's going against our inclinations to sin. Maybe it's going against concupiscence. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, I certainly think so. And I'll tell you, it's, it's brought a lot of peace to me, certainly, because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we live in a polarized yeah. world and even even people up the, the superior chain are going to yeah. be on one end of the pole or the other uh, opposite me, whatever it is. And so it, it gives me a great sense of peace of knowing, Lord, you would not have called me to this vocation if you didn't think that I could handle these situations where maybe I have a disagreement with somebody or something like that. Mm -hmm. that it, it, and it gives me a great sense of peace to just know that, hey, it's not a call for me to make about whatever it is that we've been commanded by our legitimate superior. No. Some are going to come back and say, but aren't, doesn't that mean you're burying your head in the sand? 
what would you say to that kind of comeback? I mean, does that mean you're just burying your head in the sand, ignoring problems? I, I have never felt like any of my legitimate superiors up the chain ever wanted me to bury my head in the sand. So okay. I don't bury my In other words, yeah. I, you know, looking at things, understanding them more deeply, you know, et cetera. I've been told to do things I didn't, I didn't want to do from a, sure. in, in a natural sense. Right. So, you know, did, did I, did I want to go and uh, be in Iraq when in the middle of, of, of ISIS, Daesh, you know, yeah. taking over Mosul and all, you know, it's, it's a war zone, right? It's a mm -hmm. war zone. And I'm being sent to a, you know, I'm being sent to a refugee camp. Do I want to go there? Wow. Mm, I wouldn't say my natural self sure, would want to go there. Right. But, but, but yeah. there's another side of me that says, Lord, you've, you've called me to this life. So you must've called me to this command. So I'm going to live out this command the best that I can. I'm not burying my head in the sand. In fact, I've got my, my head on a swivel and, and, and I'm looking around for opportunities to fulfill the will that God has for me. What, what was that like when you were there? That was awesome. Okay. So that yeah. was just a few years ago. Um, it, it was really amazing. You know, I feel like Christianity, I don't just feel like, I think it's true that mm -hmm. Christianity is its most authentic self when it's persecuted. And that's, that's, that's okay. a difficult thing to say because most yeah. of us feel like, you know, I'm persecuted because, you know, I don't know, because I don't like something the Pope said, or I'm persecuted because, uh, you know, my family doesn't understand my faith or whatever. <laughs> well, go someplace where being a Christian marks yeah. you for <laughs> death, right? Yeah. Marks you for death. And watch how those Christians live mm. and the faith that they have. I've just never been around anything wow. quite like that. Wow. And it's so inspiring and it's so... um Gives you a different perspective, I would and, and and it made me want it. It made me want it, right? It made me pray for it to to have that same perspective. Even if I even if nobody cares enough to persecute me that way, sure, right? Sure. Yeah. I, I want that same perspective wow. that Christians in the Middle East have. You know, I I want that so badly. There were a lot of Orthodox there, right? There are. So what, so what was your interaction like with the Orthodox? So I I was working in a refugee camp uh, uh, just outside of uh, Irbil, and it was mostly from people from. Uh, Mosul and the Nineveh Plain. So there were uh, Muslims, uh, Sunni and Shia and, you know, moderate and and, and hardcore. Right. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there were um, uh, Christians there who were uh, 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 Syriac Christians, uh, Syriac mm -hmm, right mm -hmm, Catholics, mm -hmm. uh, um, Chaldean Catholics. Mm -hmm. There were Orthodox there, obviously. Um, there, the were, um, there were some, so there, there were even some Cyril Malabar. Like yeah, it's just a, okay. it, it's, it's just a very great mix of, of people. And uh, it's beautiful to see the unity that, that can happen there. The, the unity amongst Christians and the charity towards everyone else. You know, uh, I st I'm still friends with, with a nurse that, that works there. And, and frankly, she, she can be mistreated sometimes by, by, uh, by the people mm -hmm. she, she lives around. And her sense of charity and how to do good for others is, is so inspiring that mm -hmm. I, I just wish the world could see this and, and learn from it. You know? So did you have a lot of interaction with the Orthodox? And if so, what, what was that like? I'll tell you. Well, I don't know if I can tell the story. <laughs> yeah, I will. All right, I'll tell it to you. All right. So uh, while I was there, I met the... Uh, uh, maybe I'll leave his name out. Let's mm -hmm. just say a very high ranking uh, sure. Orthodox sure. Uh, 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 man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd met him and we talked very briefly. And then I met him again in the airport as I was leaving the country. So I, yeah. I was there for about three months. And when I'm going to leave, I meet him in the airport and we kind of, we greeted each other and we, he, he kind of remembered who I was. He didn't know what a Jesuit was. He, you know, he, he didn't understand the, 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 you know, things that happen in the, in the Latin, right. Mm -hmm. Don't all happen around him, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so he didn't really know what I even was. He had a few questions for me or whatever. And, but as an American, he spoke very good English mm -hmm. uh, as an American, he said, uh, he said, you know, you don't realize this, that, that a lot of times Americans are saying to these Christians in the middle East, Oh, just come to America. We'll take care of you. Come to America. We will take care of you. He says you, that's genocide by a different means. Mm -hmm. You're going to destroy Christianity. Mm -hmm. You Americans are going to destroy Christianity mm -hmm. in the middle East. I said, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm really yeah. sorry that, that I, it, it never occurred to me because I'm thinking, how can I get all the people I love out of this place? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, then I said, well, where are you headed? He said, oh, I'm headed to Michigan with my family. <laughs> so, like, so like, oh, you know, all right, well, I guess that's how it works. You know? <laughs> so well, were yeah. you, did you see Christianity flourishing there in the midst of persecution? I, I, yeah. I mean, so so th this is this is part of, uh, you know, uh, part of this ongoing prayer, these prayers that I have of, of wanting to live like they live. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of the way they live, they're, they're having they're, they're having mass in a in a, um, a kind of a pop up 
shelter that that is that this temporary shelter that that, that shakes when the wind blows wow. and all this kind of stuff and you know but they're doing their very best to, sure. to to make it as real as they can and and the faith of those people they sing everything it's just it's just beautiful they have you know 15 deacons and another 15 sub deacons right. and all this kind right, of stuff it's right. just a really really beautiful experience of watching these people pour themselves into uh being the best that they can and making do with what they have mm -hmm. and so I, I think maybe maybe in the United States, a lot of times when we think about things like liturgy, for example, mm. uh, you know, some of some of the some of the ones who are a little bit more experimental, let's say, uh, think about the liturgy and they say, well, what's essential? And then everything else I can adapt to, to can my situation. It, okay. Right. I can modify it. And I'm really just adapting it to the to the to the to the times, you know, okay. or, or to the whatever. Right. And so yeah. their questions are all about validity versus non validity, maybe whether it's licit or not. You know, how something much like can that. I get away with? How much can I get away with a lot of times? <laughs> and, and my own culture is pushing me towards this sort of like periphery, uh, you know, uh, away from anything that would look like a papal liturgy, whatever uh, you go over there. And their main concern is how do we do something beautiful, right? Okay. How can we offer God our prayer in the most beautiful way that we can? Wow. And it's just so inspiring to see that where like, while I, I'm not going to be uh, celebrating mass or I would never want to arrange, you know, mass to look like what it looks like in a, in a shelter, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it does inspire me to want to think, how can I make, how can I make this liturgy with the people that are around me the, the best we can offer God wow. uh, in our prayers? And, and as it's handed to us by the church to turn around and offer God the very same thing. Wow. Back, you know? It's a very, very different perspective, I guess, than mm -hmm. a lot of people here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, so tell, tell me about that. What, what are your impressions here in the United States about the, the Catholic Church here? I mean, uh, there, there's a lot of mixed opinions. What's your perspective on it? Well, <laughs> you know, I, 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 first of all, I want to clarify that I'm not an expert, right? Sure. So I, yeah. I, I work at a high school. I think it's the best place on earth. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the president of that high school. So there aren't a whole lot of people pushing me to go one way or another. It's mostly me trying to, you know, trying to make things uh, move in one direction or another. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my perspective is it, it's very easy for me to tune out the noise, right? Okay. It's very, it's, it's very easy for me to, uh, and I don't want to say bury my head in the sand, but to tune out the noise and focus on what I've been asked to do. Like I have a mission, right? My, my mission, you know, is, is in a certain that place we should all be doing, you know? <laughs> so if you, if you I, knew I, your mission, if you, yeah. if you, if you understand your mission and some people, maybe they have a mission like yourself who has a mission that's, that's a much broader a broad thing. And, and there've been times where my mission was in El Paso, Texas, or yeah. my mission was somewhere else. But, but for right now, I understand that my job is to help the young men that are, that are at the, the school at where I am sure. to help those young men become the men that God created them to be. And so part of that is going to help them to help them uh, have, a, have a critical eye towards the world that, that they're in and, mm -hmm. and surrounded. But it's also to give them something solid, some classic sense of, of, of who they are who God has made them to be, how they're supposed to share those gifts with other people, how they are to be, you know, competent, you know, helpful to the, to the world in some kind of way to have a, a tool set, how to be conscious of the problems of the world, how to have compassion for their neighbor. You know, my, my job is, is that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when I, when I hear people arguing about a bishop and I, I, I yeah. can't tell you where the bishop even is. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you what the, we, I, I don't know any of the people really that are being talked about in the news story. A lot of times I, you know, a lot of times I'm thinking to myself, I, I, if, if all that I know I got from some news story, then it it's not enough for me to make any judgment about those situations. Yeah. It's not enough for me. I know that the handful of news stories that that have popped up around my life, I tend to find misreported. OK, so if I'm okay. reading the news and I see something, I, I can only assume some of this might be misreported. So I just I just kind of I, I kind of leave that stuff alone. And I, I, I don't think it. I'm burying my head in the sand. It's just yeah, yeah. more like I'm hyper focused on what I've got to do, you know. Well, I've, I've kind of noticed that as well. I've seen people report on situations and I've had some inside information on it. And I, I know that it actually is different than what they've reported. So I've, I've seen that myself. Yeah. That has caused mm -hmm. me to be a little bit more skeptical. In fact, I've experienced it. People mm -hmm. will say, Michael said this. He said that on the show. Right. And right. I know what I said. And I didn't say that. I'm being yeah. misreported. And so right. if people do that to me, they do it to others. And so th that's caused me to be just a little bit more discerning. Yeah. I've seen it reported that you have a green screen yeah. behind you. <laughs> and I'm here to, to let everyone yeah. know. Look, look at this. this can, is this on camera? Can yeah, they see it's this? on camera. Look, look at but this. What, look but at pull, this. pull one of those books on that shelf because that's where I do my solo shows. On that one, there we go. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But but it, but you pulled it from 
but you pulled it from the outside of the camera angle, so you got to pull that it. Might, yeah, you got to you got to pull one from the edge over there. I'm making a mess back here. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> but by the way, speaking of uh, the show, the Father, camera your gift. <laughs> Father, Father Brown brought me an awesome gift here. Uh, this is how you know he's a loyal viewer of the show. He brought me an actual green screen <laughs> <laughs> background with books so that I can legit I have I could add to the library this way. <laughs> yeah, I wonder it, it, I wonder if we can maybe, you know, you know give it like, a shot. Like like, <laughs> like that. There, That's great. There we Look go. at that. <laughs> How does that That'll look? work. Yeah, there you it go. Kinda looks, it kind of looks. It looks real. Halfway real. Yeah. Makes you I wonder mean, why you pay for all these books. You could have looked smart without all that money. I didn't. You know, when you first gave this to me, I immediately knew what it was before I opened it. Yeah. I'll have to do an actual you, video you with this. You could have looked well read without having spent all that money. <laughs> this is great. Again, anybody who's a, a, a frequent follower of the channel. Gets the joke. Anyways, well, yeah, once again, thank you for the for the gift there. It's my pleasure. Yeah, so <laughs> I, um, you know, back to what we were saying about the state of the church, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, some of this is it's just not necessary for us to follow up on and be aware of um, according to our state in life. In other words, I sometimes yeah. think that sometimes we get into areas and we want to know all the details about mm -hmm. this or that controversy in the church mm -hmm. when it really doesn't pertain to anything involving us or our sanctity. And I think that it's not necessarily burying one's head in the sand to say, I don't need to know everything about this, but it's it's to say. Or, or I can't know everything about right. this. I can't know all the details about what's happening right. in a certain situation. I, You know, when 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 a bishop, uh, you know, comes out and maybe let's say he disciplines someone, mm -hmm. we often think, oh, it's because the, the person they're disciplining, they're, they're disciplining him because X, Y, or Z. Yeah, yeah. We don't know what behind the scenes that bishop is being prudent and not saying, you know, so we, we just That's don't know. an example. I mean, I'm not naming names, but I know of situations where. I have some inside information about a particular priest and I know why he's being disciplined by his bishop. Mm -hmm. But in the public, people think he's being persecuted by his bishop, but that's not the case. So sometimes there's information that the bishops may have that we don't necessarily have. And that may change mm -hmm. the situation. Sure. Now, that doesn't mean that bishops are always right. Sometimes bishops make mistakes and they're, they're not infallible things. in everything they say. Right. right but but sometimes mm -hmm. i think we could give them the judgment of charity and there's other things going on yeah or, or you know I, 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 for example i'm also a fan of uh, matt frad right yeah, and yeah. so he takes 30 days off yeah just to sort of like give him you know, give himself a chance to, to yeah. recuperate after having walked in some muddy areas you know for too long sure. and i i don't have that i i, I don't have that luxury so like i can't I can't live in that world that that I have no sphere of influence over anyway. Yeah. So for myself, it's just I kind of just have like, okay, Lord, you've called me to this job in this place. I'm gonna do the very best that I can. Uh, I I love my bishop. I love my pope. I, this is this is what I am and what I do. You know. I've I've thought about doing that where I just get rid of social media yeah. for a month. Yeah. yeah. Well, I did. I mean, I used to be. Uh, I, I was. I've never been on Facebook. I've yeah. never had a Facebook account or anything like that. Mm -hmm. For a while, I really loved Instagram because I would be able to see how my. So I have a very. I come from a very large family, and I love seeing photographs of family. And then whenever I had students graduate, uh, you know, I'd start following on following those guys on Instagram, and then I'd start to see, not not frequently, but every now and then, photographs would come up where I could just see that that students that I knew were representing themselves in a light that uh, that I knew they wanted people to think that they were something that I knew they were not. Yeah, That's yeah. the simplest way to put it. Yeah. And it, it just began to kind of break my heart. And then the month of June comes around and I'm posting things about the Sacred Heart and they're posting things about gay pride or whatever. Oh, wow. yeah, and it's yeah. like, yeah. I, it just started to break my heart that I was like, I, I uh, th this world of Instagram isn't isn't the real yeah, people that I've reality. known. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the real people that, that, I, that I've known. And, uh, and and so I, I found myself just getting getting off of Instagram and getting off of all of those things. And so I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on any of those things. Now, my high school is we have we have all those, the social media stuff. And so sometimes I'll go and look to see what it is we've posted. 
but I, I, it doesn't interest me anymore to look and see what other people are, are, are interested about posting about themselves. Or anything. I've heard of Elon Musk criticizing some aspects of Twitter or Instagram like yeah. that, where he'll say people are always portraying themselves in the happiest way and the best light and even right. with filters and everything. Right. And it's, and it's a fantasy. That's he's quoting really the are. popes, right? He's <laughs> quoting Pope Benedict. He's quoting John Paul II. Even wow, Francis yeah. have said similar things, right? Yeah. About, the way that the way that a world in which we can uh, we can publish things more easily means that we're we're leaving people with impressions of, that we've manicured, right? We've curated these these impressions, sure. and sure. I, I find that to be uh, unfortunate for for the real relationships that I have yeah. th to see people do that. Now I'm not I'm not saying that technology is bad. I think it's a great way to. I still send emails to my family. I still send texts. I, mean, I, yeah. I love I love the fact that it's there, but I do not like the culture that it's created, uh, of where where everyone is a um yeah everyone's a supermodel yeah. or, or wants to be or whatever. There's some know? give and take there. Yeah. yeah, I see a lot of negativity coming from um, social media. But then again, you know, you, you also have some good features. You're able to get the gospel mm -hmm. out and reach more people. And so it's it's a give and take. Mm -hmm. And by the way, y'all go ahead and um, if y'all have any comments or questions, put them there in the comment section. Make sure to tag me at Reason and Theology. We'll grab a few uh, questions before we end the stream here. But while we're waiting on those, let me ask you, you know, what is something that you've noticed we just in the United States as Catholics could work on? I mean, we, we discussed one aspect there of maybe, you know, kind of focusing on what pertains to one state and life. But what is some more just kind of general observations and advice that you think that we could benefit from that would lead us to greater sanctity, especially as it relates maybe to Jesuit spirituality? You know? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the one of my favorite things about Jesuit spirituality is that it's really right there in between the sort of uh, medieval medieval time period and the renaissance right it, it kind of lands right it, where, where the world is shifting from one place to another and saint ignatius does such a good job of straddling both of those worlds yeah uh, for ourselves i think that we are in a time somewhere between the the, the, the common man is somewhere between modernity and post-modernity yeah. and being a good catholic being a good christian being a good uh, you know, a lover of Christ and, and and understanding what it means that God became a man. So having that real sense of a kind of a Christological anthropology, you know, at a time like this, the world needs that. And very often we are back backpedaling, like we're on our heels trying to fit our faith into modernity mm. or postmodernity doesn't say anything has to fit at all. Right. And it's, it's almost anything goes in postmodernity. Right. So we start to say that there's no real universal values or anything like that. So I do think Catholicism has the, the faithful people have an opportunity right now to uh, to present some truths which are truly human, mm -hmm. which can touch the human heart, which can make God feel more present and more uh, and more and mean more to us and help us reveal who we really are in this age right now. There, there are some special opportunities to do that. Mm. And uh, I don't want to miss it. Right. I, I hope we don't miss those opportunities, not only for ourselves, but in the people that we try to evangelize and the people that we try to try to bring into the faith. You know, this sense that, for example, the meaning of a symbolic world and what it, to, to quote uh, Jonathan Paggio, for example, I think oh, yeah. Is, yeah. is one of those people who's trying to do this. Uh, th there's a sense that, um, you know, it's all ineffable. Right. So I'm, 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 I'm falling sure. short with the words, but sure. there's there's a sense that the world is just charged with the grandeur of God. And we sometimes think that that means we have to marvel at the scientific piece of that. But it's not just there. It's mm -hmm. all over. Right. Mm -hmm. That 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 the way history plays out, the way that scripture is as alive today as it used to be mm -hmm. uh, when it was written on the day that it was written, uh, the way that Christ can be alive in our hearts is something that the postmodern world might even be more receptive to. If we if we if we get it right, if we get our message right, might be more receptive to than the modern world was, yeah. you know. That's helpful. And, you know, somebody asked a question here that I've been wondering about myself because it's been asked multiple times. Are there Eastern Rite Jesuits? Yes. Tell me about that, because I've seen that before. Where Well, wasn't Taft? He was SJ as well. Robert Taft. Yeah, he was a Jesuit. I don't know Robert Taft. Yeah, Robert Taft was really, really important Eastern Catholic theologian. Um has written a lot on the liturgy 
especially passed okay. away a few years back okay yeah he was he was a jesuit mm, sure so, yeah. yeah so so as a religious order as a catholic religious order you've got, you've got to be catholic mm -hmm. uh but you can be an eastern right catholic you can be a latin mm -hmm. right catholic and uh, and we've, we've got sense we've so got it's not so it's not that those sj started out latin right and transferred you could actually be that's already right. eastern that's right and we had an ordination just a few years ago where uh, we had one Coptic uh, Catholic who was being ordained with these Latin Rite uh, uh, Jesuits. And sure enough, there were different parts in the liturgy where uh, all of his family starts with the uh, la 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 la. You know, it was, it was great. It was, it was an excellent moment. Here, here comes Malika. I don't know if you got to probably hear him in the back. Your family's beautiful, by the yeah. way. You have a beautiful family. Malika, Malika, say hi in the camera. Say hi in the camera. <laughs> well, they, they actually can't. You have to back up over here. Come here, Malachi. Over here, right here. Right here. Come right here. Say hi to the camera. Look over the camera. Say hi. Hi. All right, now get out of here. Go. <laughs> All right. Okay, go ask Mama to do that. Go. Daddy doing a show. Hurry. Hurry. And close the door so Boxer doesn't get in here. Oh, the Boxer's on the leash. Mm -mm. You okay, son? Yeah. All right. Okay, close the door. It'll be too hot if you leave it open. There we go. You're very blessed. <laughs> Thank you, you are very, very blessed. <laughs> Mal yeah. Malachi is a handful, but he is fine. Yeah, he really yeah. is. Um, all right. So here's a question for you. Any advice for a young guy discerning the possibility of a Jesuit vocation? Yeah, I've got lots of advice for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I think. I think these things are, are best discerned over a period of time, right? Mm -hmm. So we we only allow uh, Jesuits to Jesuit novices to enter the Society of Jesus in the in the month of August, right, in the middle of August. Okay. And so you know, if you're right now thinking about it, you've got some time, right? So yeah, you've yeah. got a good eleven months to think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you want to really discern the spirits, right? Saint Ignatius has these rules for the discernment of spirits, and there's there are sort of two sets one one set of rules for the first week, which is for a man who might be or a man or a woman who might be um, struggling with different weaknesses, sin, that sort of thing. Sure. And then the, the rules for the second week, a different set of rules are about a person who's striving for perfection and what temptations might look like for for him or her. And uh, and I'd just say, go read those rules and yeah. see how they strike you. Right. And, and 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 maybe get a sense of what are the reasons you might feel called to this? What are the reasons you might be repelled from it, repulsed from it? Yeah. And. And that may very well make it clear. Like sometimes I know the things I'm most repelled from when I realize why it, it means that I need to be doing it right. I need to be embracing sense. it. And so sometimes that, that that's a very helpful way for, for someone to think about their vocation. That's helpful. This is um, another curious one here from Ramsey's. What is father's opinion on Franciscan theology? Oh, yeah. Care, care to comment there? <laughs> can I can I do it with a joke? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I, I, by the way, I've enjoyed your jokes. Thank you. Uh, you, you have some good ones. Go All right, ahead. let's hear. It. So, uh, so there's this barber, right? Yeah. And he's giving haircuts at his barber shop. And a super Catholic, right? He watches EWTN all the time. He is praying the Rosary daily. He's just a super Catholic guy. And uh, this Dominican comes in for a haircut. And uh, as he's cutting the Dominican's hair, the Dominican priest's hair, he says, uh, excuse me, I, I, you're you're a father, right? You're a priest, right? The Dominican said, uh, yes, son, I am. And he says, uh, listen, I, I give free haircuts to priests. And the Dominican says, gosh, thank you so much. I, I, you know, I'm poor. Thank you so much. So the Dominican leaves. The next morning when the barbershop opens up his shop, he finds a basket with a, a, a bottle of wine in it. And with a note that says, thank you from the Dominican priest. Mm -hmm. and the barber feels like, wow, that's, that's so, so thoughtful of this Dominican. This Franciscan comes in and uh, he sits down in the chair and the barber starts cutting his hair. He says, are you a priest? And uh, the Franciscan says, why, yes, son, I am. He says, uh, well, listen, I give free haircuts. So uh, you get a free haircut. And the Franciscan says, thank you. You know, like, look, I, I didn't even know how I was going to be able to pay you anyway. So thank you so much. This is great. And uh, the next day, the barber opens up his shop to find on, on, the, on the stoop of his shop, uh, fruit basket. And so he's like, wow, I've, I must have done a nice thing for this Franciscan, you know? So then the very next day, a uh, Jesuit walks in. Mm -hmm. And so the, the barber goes to cut his hair and he says, uh, excuse me, are you a priest? And the Jesuit says, why? And he says, well, I give free haircuts. You know, he says, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a Jesuit <laughs> priest, right? So he finishes cutting his hair and he gets the free yeah. haircut. The Jesuit yeah. leaves. And then the next morning when the guy goes to open a shop, he finds five more Jesuits waiting for haircuts. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Yeah. So in, in this case, we're picking on the Jesuits. I thought we would be picking on the Franciscans. No, I have, okay. I, have right. okay. I have great respect for the Franciscans. I have great respect for the Franciscans. They're fantastic. Uh, there are so many different versions of the Franciscans. Even mm -hmm. if I did want to pick on them, I wouldn't know who to pick on. You know? Maybe that is so picking on them. <laughs>
<laughs> that's great. That's great. Let me see here. I think there's some more. Um, okay, here we go. Do you have any favorite books for spiritual reading other than those by St. Ignatius? Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, it kind of depends on, on what you're looking for. Uh, I have found myself greatly consoled by a book called uh, He Leadeth Me okay. by Walter Chiswick, Servant of God, uh, Walter, Father Walter Chiswick. He's a Jesuit who was um, a Polish-American who found himself uh, uh, eventually in the, in the Russian gulag. And uh, he mm -hmm. writes about that experience. And I would suggest reading He Leadeth Me to almost anybody who'll listen to me. Uh, it's such a good book. Uh, favorite dinosaur. <laughs> this is a big ask because real? Malachi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Malachi insists that they are. Yeah. And he yeah. told me of a different dinosaur the other day. By the way, this is all coming up because Malachi crashed the show. Uh -huh. And the other day he did, he crashed the show and he was telling us about his favorite dinosaur. Uh -huh. And it was a dinosaur I've never heard of. And I Googled it and it was a real actual dinosaur. Oh, what was it? So I actually learned something from my son. I forget the name of it. It was really, <laughs> it was really weird. I thought it was something he made up. No, it, yeah. it was a legit dinosaur. So that's why they're asking about that one. <laughs> I, I do uh, not have a favorite. I'm we'll, sorry. We'll just say Stegosaurus. We'll say, ste <laughs> yeah. we'll say Stegosaurus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, what, what's your favorite Bible verse? You got favorite one? Bible yeah. verse. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I suppose the one I find myself thinking about the most often is the very beginning of John's gospel, mm -hmm. where uh, that word logos is just so fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. All of the implications mm -hmm. of, of describing Christ as the logos. Mm -hmm. uh, I can go on for hours and hours talking about that, so mm -hmm. I won't. But but that that is uh, that's food for thought anytime I have the time, you know. Awesome. Awesome. Well, yeah, the. Other other questions here. We'll have to we'll have to end it there. We're at the hour mark. So, Father, thank you so much for coming I'm so on glad and that doing I, this. It's yeah. an honor. Thank you. It was an honor thank for you. me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Everybody, hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. And also, of course, check me out. Patreon.com forward slash Reason with Theology. See you later. God bless. Oh wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.